It's great to see everyone this evening. 129 tonight, 129, let's all stand, 129. sacred head for such a worm as I. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the way. Was it for crimes that I had done, he groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace undone, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. 
It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Verse 4. But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Amen. Thank you, Jason. Good evening. That was on my chair. I'm glad I didn't sit on it. <laughs> I'll mention that in just a few minutes, but we do need to be praying tonight for Jason's mother. So she's not doing well. So as we pray tonight, let's remember her as well as the other folks we prayed for this morning. So Dan Manka, why don't you leave us in prayer tonight, will you please? Father, we pray for uh, Mrs. Lacey. We pray that you help her to be well, if that's your will. We pray that you would uh, help Mr. Lacey as he takes care of his wife. Mm -hmm. uh, Lord, we pray that you'd be with Jason or any that would travel out to Wyoming uh, to be a blessing to her there or to help out. Mm -hmm. Father, we and being able to be here today, we pray for Peggy, for Peggy to be yes. well. I uh, pray that she would heal her and uh, meet her needs. Uh, Father, we pray for Mrs. Barnett. Would you bless her? We thank you that uh, she is uh, listening in most likely and wants to be here. So Father, we pray for the one that uh, had the toes amputated uh, yesterday. We pray that that would heal very well and that uh, she would be able to walk uh, sufficiently with uh, without those toes. Uh, Father, for many that were mentioned uh, that have needs, uh, we pray that you'd answer each of those according to your will. We thank you for Mrs. Helmick being able to be here and for uh, Mrs. Lawfelwine uh, coming in this morning. Mm -hmm. Lord, I pray that you bless them. Yes. Uh, give us a good service tonight. Be with Charlie and help him as he uh, brings the word to God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Uh, Dan Manka put that on my chair. This, my friend, is a hunk of, what is it? <laughs> Flint. <laughs> I can see it in there, and it actually came from Flint Ridge. It's not in there. That's it. Oh, it's a whole thing. Well, are you giving this to me? <laughs> no, I didn't think so. <laughs> Did you? Well, I'm glad you brought that. We've been to Flint Ridge many times. In fact, it's a park. There's a park there. You can you can't take Flint, folks. You got to leave that alone. You get arrested. They stop that business. People would take pieces of Flint, but it is a place called Flint Ridge, and that's where this came from. Oh, did? It? That's how you got it. <laughs> you didn't get it out of the park. <laughs> well, it's good to see you here tonight. Good to have Miss Dolores tonight. And Miss Loffelbein didn't make it, Alice, but she was here this morning. So you keep praying for her. And uh, Peggy as well. She wants to get back. You say Ben is here? Ben's here. He's out in the lobby. Hey, Ben, I see you out there. <laughs> That's good. It's good to see the Lord's working, the Lord's helping and healing. And uh, we just need his blessing tonight in this service. So, Jason, you come and leave some other hand, please. All right. We're going to sing a song that the pastor had in his um, message this morning. 232, 232, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. 232. Christ our Redeemer died on the cross. Died for the sinner, paid all his due. Sprinkle your soul with the blood of the Lamb, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I 
I see the blood. I will pass, I will pass over you. Chiefest of sinners, Jesus will save. All he has promised that he will do. Wash in the fountain, open for sin. And I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Verse 4. O oh, great compassion, O oh, boundless love, O oh, loving kindness, faithful and true, find peace and shelter under the blood, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. All God's people said, Amen. I'm so thankful for that. Well, it's great to have the instruments tonight. We have a few extra, and it's great. I do have a couple fam family, but they're church announcements as well, because my kids are part of this church. But some of you know that, that Abigail, Katie, um, we already announced, is, is get, gets to go with the MTT team to New Zealand, which we're excited about this summer. When will you be leaving, Katie? In May 20th. And the Lord has um, blessed and worked it out and Abigail gets to go on the Western trip this year. So she will be leaving, um, let's see, July 8th through August uh, 15th, and they'll be getting in different places there in, in the West, Wyoming, up by Pinedale, and then into Idaho, and, and even into Nevada, Ely, Nevada. And some of those folks, we, Bernadette and I know, so that'll be neat. But so pray for Abigail and, and um, her letter will be out there. And um, I th she needs to raise a little over 3,000, but it'll be in, in three different sections. Um, so just uh, trust the Lord to provide for that. We're looking forward to pray for that. And then also, Charlie was, we got a phone call yesterday, but this has been developing some, but he um, was called by evangelist Bobby Bosler who, with, who Austin is with their evangelistic team right now, but he was called and asked to go with them this summer. So we're excited about that. And Charlie will be, we'll miss him here, obviously. At least I know, I know we will, but <laughs> we could give him a hard time, but I think we will. I know I will, but anyway, so Charlie gets to go out there. Um, I don't know where they're, they're gonna be in PA. They'll be in Indiana. Where else, Charlie? Uh, they'll be all over, but he'll be traveling this summer with um, the Bosler evangelistic team. So please pray for Charlie. We're excited about that. And um, he will get a break. He'll get to come home um, like a week after school. So we'll get to see him a little bit then before they head out this summer. So appreciate your prayers for that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Jason. By the way, I probably ought to put this down here somewhere. Uh, don't forget to take that, Brother Dan. <laughs> you don't, I'll keep it. No, just kidding. All right. Well, it is exciting that these young people get to do this. And um, the Cola Clash is under the umbrella of Jim Van Geldren's um, Minutemen. And he's been at this for many, many, many years. He carries on what's called the war. And then he has a second uh, uh, ministry he does called the War of Special Forces. And then they started the Cola Clash and Brother John, Jonathan uh, Barber used to head that up. Uh, he got sick, was laid up for a couple of years over at our church. And uh, he went into the pastorate and then Bobby, Bosley, Bobby Bosler took it over. And we've had him at Grace several times. And it's a tremendous ministry. It's a tremendous opportunity 
for these young men to work under these fellows. And uh, tremendous training, but it makes you come out of yourself. Uh, there's no room for being laid back. You got to get out and meet and greet people and try to get them into these meetings, these teenagers. My son did it with um, Jim a number of years ago, back in the 90s, and it's a stretch. Uh, it takes you out of your comfort zone, <laughs> but it is very, very rewarding. And they have seen literally thousands of teenagers saved over the last, well, Jim started back in 1984. In fact, we were the second church or the first church he had after him and Rhonda got married. So we've known John, uh, Jim, uh, Jim Van Gilden for many, many years and watched that ministry. We've had him at, uh, we had him at Glenford. We had tremendous meetings at Glenford out in the country. Uh, we had almost 200 teenagers. I think it was 194 teenagers out in a country church like that. And I remember a night well on Wednesday night, 14 young men walked the aisle and got saved. It's a great ministry, and it's a great opportunity for especially a, a young preacher boy getting ready to, to pastor or be an evangelist or whatever. So you pray for those guys. Pray for Austin. Uh, there, where are they now? Poor guys are suffering out in Texas where it's cold. Feel bad for them. <laughs> no, they're having a great ministry out there, and I don't know where else they'll be going, but they'll be going other places as well. So just keep them in your prayers. All right. Well, don't forget, next Sunday is, I'm sure you won't, but next Sunday is Easter Sunday, the 31st. We'll be having some special music during the morning service, and of course, a special message for Easter. And then Sunday night, we will observe the Lord's Supper. And it's due the 1st of April, and I thought, what better time to do it than on Easter? Amen? You all agree? All right, good. Whether you do or not, we're going to do it anyway on Sunday night, but it'll be a blessing. So uh, we'll be doing that next Sunday evening. And then, again, keep praying for the revival. Brother Jerry Savinsky, the flyers are out on the table. Take them, please. Invite folks. Get them into folks' hands wherever you go. And then uh, starting not this week, but the next week and the following week, we will be going out and hitting houses, house to house and so forth. So do what you can to help. But let's try and pray that God will bring people into this meeting. Amen. And pray that we will see souls get saved and pray that God will bring revival. Amen. So let me encourage you and challenge you with that. So don't forget Thursday night, six o'clock. All right, let's have, stand as the ushers come. Let's get ready for our offering here tonight as we take our tithes and offerings and offer them to the Lord. Roger, would you pray for us? Amen. Thank you.
Amen. Glory to his name. All right, our last selection will be 122 tonight, 122. A song I don't know that we'll ever completely understand why he would come for sinners like us, but he did, and I'm so thankful for his love. But 122, let's all stand. Why? Why did they nail him to Calvary Street? Why did they nail him to Calvary's tree? Why, tell me, why was he there? Jesus, the helper, the healer, the friend. Why, tell me, why was he there? Oh, my enemy. What is on him were laid, he nailed them all to the tree. Jesus, the dead of my sin fully paid, he paid the ransom for me. Why should he love me, a sinner undone? Why, tell me, why should he care? I do not merit the love he has shown. Why, tell me, why should he care? Oh, my iniquities on him were laid. He nailed them all to the tree. Jesus, the dead of my sin, fully paid. He paid the ransom for me. Why should I linger afar from his love? Why, tell me, why should I fear? Somehow I know I should venture and prove. Why, tell me, why should I fear? Oh, my iniquities on him were laid. He nailed them all to the tree. Jesus, the death of my sin fully paid. He paid the ransom for me. Great singing. You may be seated. Tonight, what we're going to have a special at this time. Never leaves me lonely 
whispers oh so kind, I will never leave thee, Jesus is mine. All the world seemed to sing of a Savior and King. When peace sweetly came to my heart, troubles all fled away, and my night turned to day. Blessed Jesus, how glorious Thou art! This Blessing, amen. I enjoyed that. All right. Well, it is good to have Charlie home. And uh, I don't know how many of you knew this, but uh, I did have a Bible class with Charlie and Brother Dollar's son. What was his name? Caleb. I know him well, Caleb. <laughs> <laughs> but they're long gone. They, I, I forget where he's uh, down south. I think pastoring now. I can't Carolina. remember. But uh, I uh, appreciated these young men, their zeal, uh, their commitment to the word, and their desire and eagerness to learn. And I really enjoyed that year working with these young men. We worked through a book. They had to do some sermons, and they had to preach. And uh, Charlie is doing well, and uh, God's got his hand on him. I can see that. So, Charlie, you come preach to us tonight. Thank you, Pastor. Go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 36. Psalm 36. Normally, I would accidentally say Psalm chapter number 36. I was very, uh, very kindly instructed that it is Psalm 36 when I was at college. I just want to give a testimony about what the Lord's been doing in my life at Baptist College of Ministry over the last semester. I had a really good time here at Christmas, and I had a lot of fun. It was honestly, I just love being home and being able to be a blessing to you all. And you all are such an encouragement and a blessing to me, and I was excited to go back to school this time, kind of, a little bit. And we, we got into opening meetings, and I mean, they preach hard against sin at opening meetings. It was Mr. Bosler, which Austin is traveling right now, with right now, and I have the privilege of traveling with this summer on the Cola Clash team. And it was Pastor Josiah Kagan, which is obviously we know them, and they, they were preaching hard. And Pastor Kagan was preaching through the book of Daniel during those meetings. And he was preaching about how to stand on the truth of the word of God and how to stand where God has you in the Holy Spirit's power and how Daniel just stood. And then Mr. Bosler was preaching so many convicting messages about sin. And God just did a deep work in my heart during those meetings about being happy while being at college, like just being content. And then Dr. Jim gave a challenge after they left about resting in Jesus and being happy where you are. And obviously I need school. If I didn't need school, I would just go out on the road and be an evangelist right now. So obviously I'm pretty immature still, sadly. And God was just starting to do that work about resting in him, being happy and being content where you're at, what you're doing, 
I got sick in January during the hardest class of the year. I was like, this is the stupidest thing. I'm laid out here on bed. I'm actually fervently trusting the Lord and trying in class. Like I didn't try that hard the semester before. And I'm now I'm working really hard. I'm laid out on bed for like four days, really sick. And then I got sick again, like right before Victory Conference. My dad came up last year to Victory Conference. And that's when the Lord led me to go to Baptist College Ministry. I got sick and I was like, this is the stupidest thing. I'm going to be so behind on school. There's no possible way I'm even going to catch up on my school. And that's not normally a position that I found myself in is like playing this catch up game. And I was really behind and it was not a good time. And God was just continually teaching me and breaking me that it, that it isn't about you for the most and first most. And at the These Generation Youth Summit, all the college students wore these shirts and they all say more than a college, a cause on the back. And then on the front, it says, it's not about you. And that statement just kept going deeper and deeper. It's not about you. And God was like, you need to be content while you're laying in a sick bed with my presence, just as much as you would be content preaching or giving the gospel or having fun at a basketball game or whatever you might be doing, just that rest in Jesus. And it's so easy to get caught up in life and totally just miss the presence and the voice of God. We have so many voices speaking to us, whether that be from our family or our friends or our hobbies, or most of us don't have time for hobbies. And so your job life, your work life, and life is stressful and life is busy. And it's just not a lot of fun if we're being real honest about it. And I haven't experienced very much of it yet, so I don't want to sound too ignorant up here. But what, a, what I've tasted of life thus far is not as fun as it is being here at home, getting to serve in the church while having my car and getting to go fishing all the time. It's just like college is real life. And it's, it's kind of hard. But God was showing me that I wasn't going to cruise through college. It wasn't his mission that I go up to college and God provide miraculously. And so many of you have given, and I love it when I get a letter in the mail and it just says, I'm just praying for you. It's like, wow, they care about me back home in West Virginia. And God isn't about me going up there just to cruise through college and you get a degree and whatever. He's about me meeting with him every single day. And as he began that work in my heart, and he just broke me over my selfishness and my sin. And I had some really good talks with my dad on the phone um, and my mom as well. I like to call her I'm in the practice rooms and just play the violin and talk with her. God was showing me more and more. It's not about you, but whenever you're in the trials, you can rest in me. You don't even have to get selfish in the hard things. You can just rest in my presence. And he gave me this psalm, and I'm going to try to get through most of the psalm. Psalm chapter number. There we go. I did it again already. Psalm 36. And he was un unlocking the truth and just showing it to me. And I would read it every single day. And I would pray parts of it during our student body prayer meetings. God was meeting with us in our student body prayer meetings. And the first semester, it kind of felt sort of dry. And it, not very many people were getting saved. And as a student body, we were struggling. And we kind of still are to a point. But I was just like praying this. And then God convicted me even deeper that you cannot judge other people, even if other people are wrong. And God has given me a sense of justice. It kind of comes honestly from one of my parents, which I won't say which one. And I have a tendency that when I'm doing what's right, I look at somebody else. And when they're not doing what's right, like my mind just instantly judges them. Like that's just how my mind works. And God showed me, no, it's not about judging them. Love your annoying classmates that are nerds. <laughs> and after all that breaking, I found so much peace. I found the peace of God, content in his presence, whether I was sick, whether I was playing basketball, whether I was sitting in a classroom. And I do not like sitting in classrooms, even if the teachers are amazing and they're pouring out their lives and love into you. I just have a hard time sitting in a classroom and being still. I don't know what it is, but it's just, it's just a struggle for me. And you can be rested in Jesus at all times. And that's this psalm that we're going to go through tonight just so clearly lays it out. And it's so powerful, the truth. But another thing is, is God brings opportunities when we're content in his presence. When we're so satisfied with who he is, his love, his forgiveness, his faithfulness, he brings opportunities. At college, I'm kind of known as an absolute wired up freshman that is very passionate about life and very passionate about being alive and doing things and seeing God work. But I'm also known for fooling around a lot and getting in trouble too, because when that passion isn't pointed towards God, it goes all over the place and it's just kind of wild. And so I got some demerits this semester and I got in trouble a little bit. 
And I did not think I was going to get to travel uh, on a team. To be able to travel with Mr. Bosler, the academic office has to approve you to be able to go. And that means you have to be a student of good report to be able to do something like that. And uh, I didn't think I didn't think they were going to say yes. And it just it, it humbled me so much. He came up to me before Victor Conference, and he doesn't normally ask freshmen to travel. It's a pretty rare thing that he asks a freshman to travel. And he just asked me if I wanted to go this summer. And I told him I was still praying about what to do. I wanted to come home here. And a couple of different people had asked me to go do different ministries for the summer. I didn't really want to know, didn't know what to do, but I wanted to come home is the main thing that I wanted to do. During Victory Conference, God was just working in my heart throughout the whole thing. You guys can listen to the services, by the way, if you go on Falls Baptist Church, Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, and then search Victory Conference under, under the, uh, the channel tab. You should be able to see the evening services, and they're packed powerfully. This year was talking about rising up, neglecting and putting away your fleshly, selfish living, and rising up in Jesus' power. And I think it would be very, very encouraging to our church to be able to rise up and just to hear some of that truth. But the last night, there's a man named Dr. Jim Shatler, and he has a way of proclaiming truth very powerfully, but very simply and enjoyably at the same time. And he was preaching a message about faith. His first point was pulling up your tent pegs. And God just instantly showed me through that first point, I want you to travel this summer. The second point was loving God more than the opportunities that you get. And, and in my life, it's really easy to get so excited about serving God an opportunity that I miss God in the opportunity. And God was like, this summer is not about you at all, like he showed me earlier in the semester. It's about seeing teenagers' lives change, seeing about them get saved, get right with their parents, move forward, being a blessing to churches. And then just that myself would continue to be hacked at. God would continue to prove me. Um, I'm very excited to be under the mentorship of Mr. Bosler. Austin has told me a lot of great things thus far about traveling, so I'm excited. But that is what God has done in my life this semester. And then I got put on the bus ministry, and I absolutely love being on the bus ministry. I think this Sunday they had two kids get saved, and one of them we were in their house in Milwaukee, and last week six kids got saved. And it's, it's a miracle. It's so exciting. God does something every single week. And the freshmen are not in ministries um, uh, at the beginning. They're all in their own little thing called launch. And we are ministered too. And then eventually the freshmen get launched. And most of them haven't gotten launched. And I needed that launching because now I don't have any time to fool around. I'm either focused on serving the Lord in the ministry with bus or I'm working on school. So there's like no give time for getting in trouble. And it's, it's so exciting to see God work on the bus ministry, to see souls saved. And God can save souls it's the same way here in West Virginia. It's actually easier because people are way friendly here, here in West Virginia than they are in Milwaukee, I promise, okay? Um, if you can just ask God to help you and go out and give the gospel, it's not even easy. It's pretty hard and uncomfortable for most people. And But God will bless. God will bless. And there's nothing like seeing a soul come to know Jesus as their personal savior and just to see the joy on the kids' face. They just light up and their whole personality is changed. And we can reach the families through that. And that's what God wants right here in Fellowship Baptist Church in Fairmont, West Virginia, as he wants to see bus kids reached. He wants to see families reached. He wants a church to realize that we're nothing in and of ourselves, but in Jesus, we can rise up and see God work. And so I'm encouraging you, God is gonna do a work, whether it be through a pastor or whether whatever it might be, but you got to seek God first before you start seeking the things. Because until we are content with Jesus, nothing else is gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. So let's go ahead and start in Psalm 36, I'm going to read the whole psalm, and then we're going to break it down. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, 
and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. O continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee, and thy righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, and let not the hand of the wicked remove me. There are the workers of iniquity fallen. They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. So first in the first four, uh, excuse me, first four verses, we see the problem of the wicked. And the wicked deny God in their heart. And as we read the verse there, how often do believers like me and you deny God in their heart? I find so often in my daily life, I get up, I get focused on what I have to do for that day. And it is so easy that in my class time, and then whenever I'm spending time studying with my buddies or whatever, and they're kind of annoying and frustrating, and I'm kind of annoying and frustrating back to them. And then a day just progresses. And you know how it is at work when your day just progresses and it gets harder and harder and harder and it gets bumpier. And we can so subtly deny God in our heart, even as a believer. It's talking about the wicked, but it can be talking about any sinner, and we get so self-focused, and we don't care about God's desires at all. It's so easy to get focused on the big number one and lose God's heart and God's focus through trials. What about in trials? How often is it to deny God in trials? Mr. Daniel Van Gelderen is a great man of God. He's Pastor Van Gelderen's son, and he works with the college students every single week. And he looks at us and he says, if you all are going through trials, if you're struggling with sin and temptations, and you don't believe God to deliver you, you're an atheist. And that came across pretty strong the first time that he said that. And I was thinking about that. And as a church, if we don't believe God can bring us through our trials and our temptations, and if we don't believe God that he can save souls and that he can provide a pastor and that he can rise up Fellowship Baptist Church, we are literally atheists. And that struck me so hard. Like, how often do I not believe God for my classwork assignments? When we go out soul winning and you get doors slammed in your face 10 times. And like, this is stupid. God's not going to do anything. And then in temptations and sin, it is you do not ever, ever have to sin. You are in union with Jesus Christ. And because you are in union with Jesus Christ, he has paid completely for your sin. And it's, it's, it's done. It's under the blood. And so every time you sin, you are willingly saying, God, I am not walking in the light. I'm choosing to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And God says, that is sin, and I hate it. And you are literally against God. You're an enemy of God every time you sin. And Mr. Reamers, as our dorm supervisor, he's been pounding into my heart, the fooling around and not doing, being focused on my school and on soul winning and on what God wants. I am literally an enemy of God. I might as well be an atheist. And it's so easy for Christianity to get so passive and so comfortable with what we're doing. We don't want to see God work. We don't have a burden for souls. We don't have a burden to move forward because we're so content and so selfish that we literally deny God and say there is no God. And God says in that verse that a fool denies God and says that there is no God. And then we'll turn over to Psalms chapter 14. Psalms chapter, there we go. I said it again. I told you I was going to do it. Psalm 14, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if for there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. It's so easy to, to have this heart shift happen. This is not a matter of who you are. This is a heart matter. This is not a matter of your position, maybe what you are. And to clarify that, you are a child of God. You are in union with Jesus. Jesus has paid for your sins. And so to deny God and be a fool like the unbeliever is literally to deny that Jesus died on the cross. And that was really strong. God just struck me with that fact. He said, you are a fool, Charlie. You're a fool. So many things you do are not what you say that you want to do. They're against me. And as a church, it's very easy to get discouraged and to say to God that there is no God because we're consumed with the things that we want to do with our jobs, with our families, with our hobbies. And it's so easy to get consumed 
And David always begins several of his psalms, not always, but several of his psalms, he begins with talking about the wicked. And it also has to do with the devil. And I, I have been shown so much that the spiritual warfare aspect is such a big deal. It's easy to not even think about the devil working, and it's easy to blame other people for our problems. It's easy to blame God for our problems, but it, our problems are never God's fault. It's always our fault. It's always my fault. It's never other believers' problems. It's so easy to look at other churches that might not be the exact same way that we are or to look around in our own church and be like, well, they don't do this the way that I think it should be done, and they don't do it either, and this person doesn't really do this. And God in the Bible is saying, get over it. It doesn't matter. We'll look at it later in the psalm. It doesn't matter. Stop judging other people. And the verse we were going to look at was in Ephesians, where it talks about we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power. Our enemy is not believers. We should be encouraging each other through the love of Jesus. If you see somebody else that is struggling, come aside them and say, brother, can I pray for you? Sister, can I pray for you? And get over your pride. You're too, you're too comfortable to ask them. You don't want to ask them because it might make you feel uncomfortable. Well, who cares how you feel? Go up to that brother, that sister, and pray with them and encourage them. I'm so thankful that you all are very, very encouraging to me, but I see it a lot in Christianity, and I see it in my own life, where we judge other people so quickly. And I was in a prayer meeting. Uh-oh. I was in a prayer meeting, a fellowship prayer meeting. We have them every single Friday. And we were praying, and I just I thought to myself, whatever that person just prayed, they don't mean that. They don't really believe that. And it's... The devil is really, really good at deceiving us. And that's the second part in verse 2 or 3, deceivers of themselves. We think that our own way is good. And right in that, in that second verse in chapter 36, for he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. It's really easy for us to get set in our own ways and to do what we want to do and think we're okay. Let me tell you, we're not okay. We're not okay. If we think we're okay as a church, it's over. We're done. We're not okay. Individually before Jesus, we're not okay. This This is a big deal. The leper came to Jesus because he needed cleansing, and he needed complete cleansing. What if the leper had just gotten partial cleansing? What if he just said, Jesus, can you cleanse my hand? Well, then his legs would have fallen off. We need a complete cleansing work of God. It's a little bit of a ring, maybe. We deceive our own selves when we think in our hearts that we're okay. And God struck me and he says, Charlie, you are not okay. All sin is hateful. It's abominable. And it sent people to hell and it put Jesus on the cross. It is not okay to live in sin. It is not okay to be content thinking wrong thoughts towards others when God is supposedly using you. Like you can get so caught up in what God is doing in your other life that you say whatever they're doing has to be wrong because it's not what I'm doing. That is not how God views it. I'm so convinced that if sinners, excuse me, believers would get broken over their sin, if I would get broken over my sin, God would do a changing work. If we saw how abominable our iniquity was in the second verse, until his iniquity be found to be hateful. And I was in tears. I was so broken when I was, after that prayer meeting, I went back and I was just seeking God and he brought me to this psalm. And he said, see cleansing. We'll see in the next part of the psalm where God talks, it talks about God being the fountain of life. Church family, we must be broken about our sin. It's abominable to God. God hates our sin. He hates the little wrong thoughts. He hates when you're outwardly disrespectful to your parents. He hates whenever you don't love your husband or your wife the right way. He hates it when we don't believe him. It it was soul winning. He, He hates it. It's abominable. But David, I think this is really interesting. I was starting to talk about it. Lays out all of his problems before the Lord. Right there at the beginning. He talks all about the wicked. And I was comparing myself and us to the wicked. But we can be honest with God. That's so so, uh, comforting to my soul. God cares about us. We sing the song, Does Jesus Care? Oh, yes, he cares. Jesus cares so much about us, and he's so very interested in our problems and our trials. And instead of deceiving ourselves and getting on our selfish track and saying that our own way is okay, go to God, 
I remember there was a day when God had just done something yesterday. We had seen somebody get saved. And then the next day we had a quiz and I don't normally study for quizzes as much as I should, just being honest. I normally still do pretty decent on them, but I studied for this one because I thought it was the right thing to do. God had been working in my heart. So I studied, I spent like 20 minutes, which should have been plenty enough time on a eight ish question quiz to do well. And I bombed the quiz. I did horrible on it. And then I was talking with one of my friends and he said something that wasn't very nice at all. And so I slapped back at him and said something that wasn't nice back. And the whole day was just like spiraling out of all over the place. And I was getting really frustrated. And I went downstairs and downstairs at Baptist College of Ministry, we have the, uh, the prestigious workout room. And uh, there's only about two people that use that workout room. It's me and my best friend. And so I always know that it's going to be empty whenever I go down there. And I went down there and I just threw out all my problems before the Lord. I wasn't even respectful at all. I just threw it out there. said, God, this is the stupidest thing. I flopped on that quiz. And now I was mean to my friend. And I haven't even been thinking about my home church or my family at all. I didn't even pray today when I got up. I got up late. And this day is going horrible. And just blah. And I was miserable. And God just enveloped me in peace. He loves it whenever we come to him with our problems. He wants to hear from us. It's just like your parents love you. Your parents wanted to hear when something was wrong. If they were good parents, that's not how bad parents are, but God so, so cares about how you're doing. When was the last time that you just went to God and you just laid it all out there before God? And when you do lay it all out there before God, then God shows you your sin. And that, that was so enlightening and encouraging to my soul. I laid it all out there before God. And then he just broke me so much over my sin and filled the room with the presence of Jesus. And I had so much peace and encouragement. I guarantee every single person in this room has cares and troubles and trials on their mind. I know my family does. It's definitely not easy with my grandma not doing very well at all. It's, it's hard. I mean, we all know what it's like for loved ones to go through very hard things, but everybody in this room has something that they're going through. Be honest with God. Take time. Take time and go before God and say, this is, this is horrible and this is bad and this is messed up. And I'm just telling you because you're my heavenly father and I know you care about me. And he's going to listen. Tell, tell him anything. Tell him everything. Even the little details that you don't think matter. Tell God. He cares. He wants to hear and we'll see in the next part, David always begins his prayers after he's laid it all out. And if you're just starting your prayer time in the morning, David begins his prayers with a heart of praise. And those next few verses, it's just so amazing. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. That is so awesome. God is so faithful, and he's a sovereign God, that's something that we see in that verse six, thou preservest man and beast. God is in complete control of everything. And David starts his prayer, thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. He praises God for being a merciful God. And even though we're vile, wicked sinners and God hates our sin, he's a merciful God. He's pursuing after you because he wants to forgive you and restore you. And David is praising God. When was the last time that we started our day by acknowledging God? When, when was the last morning when we got up and we said, good morning, God, I'm thankful that you love me this morning. When was the last time during the day, whenever we were going through something hard and we thanked God for who he is? God's faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. He's always faithful when we're not faithful. And let me tell you, I'm not faithful very much at all. But God is faithful. Take your troubles to him. If we didn't have troubles, if we didn't have trials, if sin wasn't a thing, then we wouldn't need preaching and we wouldn't need prayer and we would just be perfect like God. And I know you guys are sinners. I know you struggle with sins because I'm a sinner and I struggle with sin. And I'm made out of the same stuff that you are. And I feel even as Christians, the older that we get, the more mature we feel like that we are and the less we need to bring things to God because we got it all figured out and the more years you grow older the less you need God and God wants the faith of a child he wants the faith 
of a child. He wants you to just go to him and praise him for who he is. Lay your problems out. He is trustworthy. David's rest in the Lord. Rejoicing under the shadow of thy wings. It talks about in verse 7. Is literally a recklessly abandoning to, of self and running to Jesus. And he's grasping God. And he's resting in who God is. He praised God for it. The Bible says that's who he is. And that's who you are in Jesus. And you run to God and embrace him. And rest in who he is. Don't think about yourself. It abandons self. If you bring self to the table with God, you're not going to find rest and peace. That's what I was talking about, laying all those things out before God and then run to God and rest under his wing. And the illustration that I was reading about is like the hand of all of our chicks under and they're safe. Nothing's going to get you. I remember I was a little kid at my grandpa's house. They had this big stove. I'll bunch of you in there down in the deep dark scary basement. And as a little kid, I did not like going down into that basement by myself. It scared me so bad to go down into that basement by myself. And to be quite honest about it, my sisters were braver than I would, and they would actually go down there and turn on the light before I was. And I was so scared of the basement. But the basement had all of our toys and fun things to do. And so obviously I wanted to go down there. And I knew that if my dad went down the stairs with me, it was okay. And in your day, whenever you're in a ton of physical pain or whenever you go to work, whenever you're having a family trial or family problems that's happening, it's just like, ah, and it's struggling and you're not finding the peace of God. When you embrace who God is, you grasp God and you let go of self and you let go of sin and you rest in Jesus. There's a peace that comes. And that's what I found this semester when I just get it out there before God and it's open and I'm clean and God has cleansed me. He's faithful to just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's why I said you can't bring partial self to the table. It's an all or nothing deal. It's a complete surrender. There's no half surrender. Brother Michael Garamee, who we, we took on as a missionary. Well, that man just saw like 217 people get saved in Africa. I mean, God is using him in incredible ways. And it's, it's so challenging to my heart every single time he gives a testimony. But at the missions conference, he was preaching. And he said, American Christians should sing, I surrender half. I surrender half. Half to Jesus, I surrender. And you cannot rest in the goodness of God when you're holding on to something of self. Let go of whatever it is and run to Jesus and cling to him. And he has you under his wing. And the world and the trouble and the trials, nothing can get to you when you're resting in Jesus. And American Christianity is not characterized by rest. Our lives are busier than they ever have been ever in the whole history of the earth. There's so many distractions, so many voices, social media, the news, all the troubles of the world plague us all the time. Politics plague us all the time. All these things, all these unknowns, all these variables. But rest. Listen to the voice of God. When you're under his wings, you can't hear any other voices except for the voice of God. Be content to rest in the voice of God. And then David sees... The realization of God in verse 9, and this verse changed my life this semester. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. There is no other light. There is no other life outside of a walk with Jesus. God is life. Anything we pursue, anything we pursue, and I mean anything, I'm thinking through in my own heart. God shows me on a constant basis in my own heart things that come between me and the Savior. Anything, those that we pursue, that is not God. God is life. God will take us when we're under his wings and we're broken of our sin and he'll fill us with his life. I'd like us to go to Psalm 63. This is another Psalm that God has just so used in my life. O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. 
The reason David could so freely praise God is because he had his heart fixed on God and God only. Church family, there is nothing else in this world worth living for than Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowships, fellowship of his suffering be made conformable unto his death. And I want us to, to look at well, what is my driving passion? Think about it with me for a second. What is your driving passion? What gets you up in, what gets you up in the morning? Now, there can be a lot of good things that can be our driving passion, but there is nothing that should be our driving passion except for God. So a lot of good things that are okay, they're not sinful, that are, could be our driving passion. But our driving passion should be the loving kindness of God. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. And I'll begin reading in verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. David's prayer in the last two verses is a prayer for power. After he lays out all of his problems before the Lord and he gets cleansing, from the Lord, and he, he doesn't want to be a fool, and he doesn't want to be deceived by the world and the world's things and by the devil. And when he gets clean before God and he's resting in the character of God, he prays for power. He prays, let not the foot of pride come against me. And then he prays, praises victory over the wicked. I think this should describe our, our lives. We are no longer children of darkness. After we accepted Jesus Christ into our hearts, I trust that everybody here tonight is a believer. We cannot walk in the flesh anymore. See, some Christians, and I for a long time, was so confused that like the spirit and the flesh like warred back and forth against each other and whichever one you fed more kind of sort of won the battle. And that is not how it is. The flesh died whenever you accepted Jesus, whenever Christ died on the cross, it's dead. Yes, you can, whenever you sin, you are in the flesh, but who you are in Jesus never sins. Your spirit never sins. Who Jesus is, is who you are, and you cannot sin. And it greatly disturbed my heart to think that I live so much of my life not even who I am. In the flesh. Every single moment that we're not walking in the spirit, we are in the flesh. The flesh is dead and nasty, and it's not a battle. This doesn't say strive to do better. The verse doesn't say do your best to do better. Dr. Jim says all the time, because you are, do. He says that on a regular basis. Because of who you are in Jesus, do. And David was embracing his identity in Jesus Christ back there in the song. When he came to the realization that God is life, your life should be totally wrapped up in Jesus because you are in Jesus and he is in you. The flesh is done. You don't have to try to do better. In fact, the harder you try to do better, the more it is about you. But whenever you abandoned self and you ran to God, you were saying that you agreed with God and who you are. And this could change. This could change. This is not, this is not completely what I'm saying. This is what Pastor McGaldrin teaches us on a regular basis and Dr. Jim. And I don't know what happened, but American Christianity got so flesh dependent. And so let's do our best for Jesus. And that is wrong. God cannot use you. And people can't get saved. You can lead somebody to the Lord in the flesh, but that is not who you are. That is not good. That is not right. God wants you to awaken to who you are in Jesus and walk in the light because you are the light. God lives inside of you. You are one with Jesus. So encouraging us tonight as we're closing, 
I know that I know that people struggle with sin because I struggle with sin and we all struggle with trials. How about laying them before the Lord tonight? How about saying, God, I'm done with this and this and this thing. These things bother me and I'm so wrapped up in them and my identity is so consumed in those things. And I know there's not right. There's not peace. Giving those things up to God and saying, God, I want to live your life. I want to see you work. It's not about me making the most money. It's not about me making sure my kids have a comfortable life. It's not about me being content coming to church, but never giving the gospel to anyone throughout the week. It's your agenda. I'm awakening to who I am in Jesus. Fill me with your Holy Spirit power and show me what you want me to do this week. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for who you are. God, you're a faithful God. You're a loving God. Lord, I pray that you would just help me to be a channel of your life. Lord, so often my life is consumed with the flesh, but God, I'm so thankful that the flesh is dead. God, just please forgive me of my selfishness, my pride. Lord, I'm identifying with you. I'm resting in you. I'm so excited to see your Holy Spirit work and to continue to see people get saved and just to be satisfied with your presence no matter the trial that I might be going for. Thank you so much for the church family, their love, their encouragement to me and to my family. Just pray that you would bless bless them in your precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you for the message, Charlie. There's a truth that Charlie brought out there that we need to deal with and understand. We are born again in our spirit and the Holy Spirit dwells there. We are to be filled with that spirit, which means totally yielded, totally surrendered. And when we are totally surrendered and yielded to the Holy Spirit, we're not going to be sinning against God, but we yield to the flesh. And we're dead to the flesh. Read your Bibles. We're dead to the flesh. But we can still allow it to rise its ugly head. And we surrender. We submit to it. We don't sin because we have to. We don't have to. We sin because we choose to. Wrong choice. Amen? Wrong choice. We get in the flesh so often. We're supposed to be walking in the Spirit. Isn't that what the Bible says? Well, isn't that what the Bible says? Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We get in the flesh too often, don't we? That old dead corpse, rotten, stinking. Amen. God hates it. So let's take this to heart. Okay. God's people need to learn how to yield, surrender, and walk in the spirit of God and have victory over sin. And especially over your enemy, Satan who tempts and wants you to go back to the flesh. Thank you for that message, Charlie. Let's stand as we sing a song. God spoke to your heart tonight. Folks, listen, if God spoke to your heart and the Holy Spirit rattled your cage, so to speak, then I would do business with God tonight before I left. Amen? I would be doing business with the Lord. As we sing, what number? 269. 269. Why don't we have the piano play through a verse, and then we'll sing one or two in a minute. Sing verse one together. Under his wings, I am safely abiding. Though the night deepens and tempests are wild, 
Still I can trust him, I know he will keep me. He has redeemed me and I am his child. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever? Under his wings my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Thank you. 